Folks, my name is Adam. Um, I teach computer programming and game design at the Panko Center in the Las Cruz District to high schoolers, students who have never uh, encountered coding before, generally. Um, so I'm going to do my best to make this sort of a, an absolute beginner's level one hour course. Um, it's a lot to cover, so I apologize in advance for my uh, potentially blinding speed. Um, I will answer questions and feel free to, to slow me down as we're able, but again, I am going to try to get through the entire scope of the content for this this test. This is not meant to replace um, the hours of, of study and practice that you will put in between now and the test. Um, this is just a primer so you know where to look and have seen some of this stuff before. Um, so don't just do this and then uh, immediately walk in and expect to succeed on that. It will take practice to become good enough to tackle the questions that we're going to be posing to you on the uh, actual event day. Um, okay, so uh, what we have here are some comments here. Um, this is on the online-python.com compiler. This reads our code and runs it. So the top part of your screen will be where you write your code. And then down at the bottom, we've got this nice little, I can hit run, and then it's going to show me. I don't have anything happening yet. So I don't think so. There's nothing. Uh, I guess I can just hit stop because um, there's nothing happening yet. Um, but there will be in a moment, OK? Uh, comments on here. Start with this little um, and the, this little hashtag symbol, shift three on your keyboard. The official name for that is an Octothorpe. Extra nerd points if you knew that already. Um, uh, the hashtag symbol, as the younger folk may know it. Um, anything in the line after that symbol will not be read by the compiler at all. But it is super, super important that you get in the habit of writing those. What you should do is make a plan for what you're going to do uh, in those notes, those comments, before you actually do it. That's known as pseudocode. It's going to be vital to your success on any sort of free response question, any sort of coding that you're ever going to do. Make a plan first. That's the number one thing that I teach my students. If you're not writing pseudocode comments in advance of, of your code that you write, then you're just not a good programmer. Um, and so I really try to impress that regardless of what language you have, learn how to write comments, documentation for yourself, make a plan before you do it, okay? I already have some comments for myself strewn through this, this program so that um, I know which topics to cover for you so that we can hit everything. Okay, um, so let's get right to it. This is a bit about functions I have in parentheses because that's actually gonna be the very last thing I cover, so put a pin in that. I'm down here on the print statement. Okay, uh, the simplest statement that you can write in Python, which is the language that we're covering here, which is uh, designed to be easy to learn uh, for beginners and is a good first language to start with. Not only that, but it's also the fastest growing language and I believe as of a few weeks ago, the most popular language in the country professionally. Um, so learning Python is a very useful skill. Uh, and it teaches you the fundamentals of what you need to know. Personally, I recommend learning one of the C languages as you take it more seriously, as, as you grow in your skills. But uh, Python is a nice starting point for us. So it's what we decided to switch the test over from JavaScript uh, last year. OK, so a print statement. We're going to write our first line of actual code. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to type print. It needs to be lowercase. And then use your parentheses. And the parentheses uh, indicates that we're calling a method that exists already. Um, and in that thing, I'm going to put a message. Uh, that message is going to be in quotation marks, which is right next to your enter key if you hit shift. So I type my quotation marks. It'll autofill the second one for me, which is really nice. Um, and the message that I'm going to type is the first message that every programmer should uh, type the first time, which is hello world. If you have typed this message and then run your code, so you can click that, or you can type that in somewhere in your compiler portion up above. You can, I'm gonna scroll down here, you can hit run, and then there is the results from your code actually running. And if you have that, congratulations, you are a programmer, good work. I guess we're, no? Okay, more. Okay, I am gonna make a note for you here, uh, a, a comment on this. So after I have my hello world statement, which you'll notice doesn't need anything else to run. In some languages, you'll have to indicate when the line ends. In Python, if you have any previous experience or have seen some other code, um, it just goes by where you hit enter, essentially. It says, oh, that's the line of code. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is make a note here. Um, uh, the message in quotes, is called a string. We're going to be working a lot with strings. Basically, every print statement only uses these strings. 
Um, and so it's important we understand what a string is. It's a message in quotations. Um, it has a value that is basically any characters, um, letters, numbers, whatever. Question? Uh, I just want to make a comment. I just wanted to mention that when there's a return code of zero, that usually means that your code was correct. So anything other than that should be a, a sign that you have something, something wrong, right? Return code uh, zero. Yeah, I, I think that um, this is just the particular quirk of this compiler that'll tell us that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat that much. Um, it, you're going to know if it doesn't run for you. You're not going to get any output. It's going to give you a big message in red. You know, if I say any random code, I'll even leave the typo in. Does it work? Something like that. Does it work? And then I try to write. It doesn't like any of that. <laughs> okay, so that's not code. It's got to actually be code. And you can put whatever you want in a comment there, but um, you'll know if it's not running for you. Oh, no, no, it's not running for me. Try it again. Run. <laughs> Why is it running now? I didn't leave anything weird in there, did I? Oh, no. Doesn't want to run anymore. That question broke my code. Why? <laughs> there we go. It's back. I just needed to change that, I guess. I don't know. You're going to... The compiler that we're going to use is fairly, like this one is fairly basic um, because it's just running off of a website and not with a built-in package on your computer with all the support files it needs. But for the, you know, year one type coding that we'll be doing, um, it's plenty sufficient and can cover everything we need. Okay, so that's a, that's a fundamental print statement um, there to print a simple string-based message, okay? You can put two string messages together. Um, <coughs> So uh, we can put two string messages together inside one of these print statements or in any string area by using the plus, which is a pretty important operator for us, um, and that's called concatenation. So I'll say hello, and then space there, and I'll go plus, and I'll say world again. <laughs> there. So you should do that. You should run it. Hope it's running for you. It's it's really giving me fits now. There it is. <laughs> okay, so that's a that's a basic print statement. Um, this this plus I used here, uh, combining two strings with plus is concatenation. Well, I guess it's not that important that you know exactly that word, but that's what we're doing there. Concatenation. Can I fit it all? Nope, can't fit it. Can, can, oh well, I probably can. There, better. <laughs> now it all fits. I don't say combine anything. Okay, so the first line prints this, the second line prints this. Straightforward enough for print statements. That's the probably single most basic and, and maybe arguably most important um, thing that you want to be familiar with. Okay. Now, if you would like to concatenate a string with something else, like a number, for instance, that's not in quotes, um, you can do that too, but you need to specify that we're printing that as a string. So to do that, we use the stir method, I guess. Uh, that's the best name I've got for it. Okay, so what I'm gonna print is, uh, I printed that, and then I'm gonna say stir with a two. There's that. Okay, so I concatenated twice. The number in the middle, I had to say, I'm printing this as a string. That's what that stir thing does. So um, stir uh, value turns it to a string. That's, I, I, the, the word here is casts it to a string. That's the official word for what I just did there, where I changed that thing to a string so I can print it. Um, that's, that's what does that for us. All right, it'll be really useful for printing stuff. We're gonna use it quite a bit in this uh, sort of lesson here. Okay, so you should run that, and um, you can see that there's my two printing as a string. If you try to do it without the stir, it will give you an error. Uh, it will not like that very much, and uh, you'll wanna realize, oh, I forgot to turn it into a string. I did that in the earlier session, where I couldn't figure out where my error, it looks good, and then, oh, I forgot to turn it into a string when I was printing it, so. It's important in Python. 
Okay, any questions so far about print statements and concatenating and casting to a string? That's really the only kind of cast that you will need, I believe, for uh, our content here. Were the people who are running along um, able to get the output, more or less? Am I all right to move on? All right, hearing no objections, I'm gonna move on. Okay, so um, that's all well and good, but what you've got yourself so far is essentially a fancy word processor, so it doesn't really justify its existence as far as coding. Um, there are probably three big areas that really give coding its power, and uh, the first one I would consider to be variables. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing I'm gonna show you. These variables hold a value, and we can change that value, and that's extremely useful. So rather than you know print this two here, I would have something with a value of two, and I would use that instead. All right, so uh, variables are very, very useful. Um, declaring a variable in Python could not be easier. You just give it a name, and then you say equals, and then you say what you want to be in that uh, variable. What value do you want it to hold? And because Python is not what we would call a strongly typed language like many other languages are, you don't even need to specify what you're gonna, uh, like what type of information you're gonna put in there, you can just pop it right in there, and it can hold anything. It's a generic variable. Um, so it can hold uh, a number. So my first variable, I will call it, um, I don't know, var one, how about that? Uh, equals uh, seven. Or it can hold a string, like we saw those messages there. We'll say var two equals, um, Family. I'll go back to what I had before. Okay, so um, var1 is now a variable that holds the value 7. var2 holds the string value family. Okay, so that's, that's what I did there. I've, I've uh, basically earmarked space in memory with those labels on them, var1 and var2. Uh, your variable names can be basically whatever you want, as long as you start them with a letter and don't try to put like a space inside it or any like weird characters. It can be letters, numbers, underscore. I think that's all that's allowed in variable names. Okay. So uh, what I can do here is I can print the value of those variables. So we'll say we will print, um, and we'll give context for our output here. So we'll say var1 equals and then I'll do my concatenation here, and then I'll do a stir var1 instead of a number there. Any place where I would use a number, I can use this instead. So I've concatenated this string with uh, that string because I cast my var1 my bar to a string. So if you run that, it should say bar one equals seven in your output. So make sure you can get that if you're running it. Run and bar one equals seven. That's nice. Really quickly, I want to introduce you to a special character that can go inside of a string. A couple of special characters, actually. So um, let me, I guess we'll add that here. Um, these are called escape sequences. There are two of them that I will teach you. Uh, inside a string, backslash n would be to end the line immediately. And then backslash T would be tap spacing. So before I print var2, I'm going to put inside that string a backslash n, and it's going to take me down to the next line in my output. It's a nice little shortcut inside your strings. Good for, uh, so print 
we'll do a backslash n this time, and I'll just do var2 equals, and then I'll do, I'm gonna go ahead and do the stir thing just because it's a good habit to be in. I know it's a string right now, I don't technically have to, but it could potentially hold something else, so I like to have it that way. Let me put a, a couple of tabs here actually, so that we uh, can see what that does also. Backslash T, backslash T, there's my tab spacing there. Just so you can see it in the output there. Oh no, it didn't like that, why didn't it like that? Oh, I foul two, R2, sorry. All right, there's that. So there's my, oh shoot. Um, this is where my, oh, come on. Uh, my end line, my backslash N got me. Normally it would just print on the next line. You see this line of white space here? That's my backslash N in action. Okay. And then this, I have these tabs here. You can see those tabs in between there in my output. Those of us old people were we call that a carriage return. Ooh, a carriage return. return. Right? Wait, what would you call the uh, backslash T though? Still a just tab. a tab? A tab. <laughs> yeah, a carriage return, yes. Like this is a typewriter, right? It is a carriage it's return. It's a carriage return on yes. the typewriter? It's a, it's a tab on the typewriter. We cool 21st century kids call it an end line. <laughs> Did you know what an octothorpe was though? I had not heard that word before. That's the official di dictionary word. How are we doing? Are you guys... Are you on board here? Going pretty well? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. The steam train of my teaching style does have some limited breaks. <laughs> okay, were we able to get that output? More or less makes sense so far. Um, just a couple of new characters there, and then I just printed the variable value, and you can see it here in action. There's var1 holds seven, var2 holds family, as I said, would lie to you. Okay. Now, um, let me show you some of the arithmetic operators here. Um, you can use, just as you'd expect with any numbers, you can use plus, minus, uh, multiply, divide, and they're pretty much the characters that you'd expect on your keyboard, but we better see them in action first. Okay, so there's my special sequences, end line, or carriage return, and tab, uh, right there inside of the strings. All right, all right to move on, objections? No objections. Okay, arithmetic operators, operators. I will continue to use that variable value of, of uh, or I'll use var1 and var2 um, to do this. We will say, uh, let's put it right inside a print statement. We'll say, I'm gonna put some space in between these first. So first I'll do the backslash n to go to the next line and I can clean up my output that way. Um, and I will give context to my output. So let's do this, let's go, uh, stir var2, which is family, right? Um, we'll say size. And then in parentheses here, I'll do a stir, and I'm going to add var1 to itself. Var1 plus var1. Since those are numbers, I can get away with that. So you'll notice here that my plus is doing something different. Because it has two numbers around it, it's not like concatenating them, it's adding them together. That's adding or addition. I realize I've just made a very large family. 14. Okay. So that bar two. Yep. That bar one holds a value of seven. So the way that any logic works in coding is it works from the inside out. So it evaluates the parentheses here var1 plus var1, which is seven plus seven, which gives me 14. And then um, it will go ahead and concatenate my four different strings that I have there. Just pop them together, and that's what you see in my output here. Noting that I also used var2, which is family there. If you've never seen code before and you followed that logic, good job. Child slash DJ Arthur, by the way. 
Okay, we're able to get that out. But anytime you have parentheses, you have to make sure you have an open and a closed parent. <coughs> Otherwise, it will create an error for you. So make sure you're careful with that. A lot of times when you create the open parent, it will make the closed one for you automatically on here. So that will help. But uh, if you're going back and altering your code, that's a common mistake. Uh, so if you get, what I would recommend is as you're typing your code and as you're getting in here with the materials that we provided the links for, um, I would definitely run it frequently as you're typing it. That way you know you're avoiding errors. The advantage of, of this stuff over mathematics in terms of learning logic because you can really see the results of what you're doing. I'm a math teacher, so I'm allowed to say that. Okay. Questions about how I use the variables? Yes, question there? I was just going to ask about the material and like. Yes. Are they going to update that to JavaScript? Like the old tests, it's all. It's in JavaScript currently. We're going to update it to Python, yes. Oh, awesome. I'll try and do that within the next week. I was learning for them, but I'm learning it as I go, too. So I'll try Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right, to move on. Moving on. All right. Uh, oh, I want to show you the other operators real quick. Um, so I'm going to use my best friend, which is copy paste here. Um, I guess I'll just create some more with my output from my other operators here. So let's actually copy, write one and then copy paste that. Um, let's do subtraction here. Uh, we'll update the value. Let's let's use a couple new values here. Um, we'll say x equals um, negative four, and we'll say y equals. 13.5. Again, it doesn't matter what type of information you put in these variables um, because Python will just automatically assume you want to store that inside the variable and you're good to go. Makes it very easy to work with variables. Okay, so this time I'll print just the um, other operators using those two values. So we're going to print. Um, I don't need any more backslash ends. Let's just print context for what we have here. So stir x plus, and we'll do a minus this time here, plus stir y, and then equals, and then we'll actually do the operation, which is stir x minus y. Okay, so what I've done here is I've put five different strings together, two, three, four, five, yeah, five different strings together here, um, the last of which has the actual operator in it, operation happening, it's x minus y, right? The rest is just printing the context so you can see in your output what you're actually doing. That's very important when you're coding. Have context for what you write. Okay, so there's your subtraction there. All right, so if you run that, you should see this whole statement. It should give you uh, whatever the value of x is minus whatever the value of y is equals, and then whatever the value of x minus y is. The advantage to using variables and not just hard coding these as numbers in is you can very easily change those variables and it's gonna change your whole output very quickly, okay? You start to see that as you write slightly more complicated code. Using variables over what we call literals is very handy. So hopefully you're more or less envisioning what your output should be as you're running it, but the best thing is to run it and try and get that output. Um, here's mine, nope, doesn't wanna cooperate. <laughs> Here's mine. There it is. Okay. Right under family size there. Oh, no. What just happened there, Adam? Why did that not run? I don't know. I, it ran all through the first session, and then this guy asked a question. <laughs> and then it's, I don't know. Uh, but if, if you hit stop and then run it again, eventually it's going every time. So, so I, this, is, this is a symptom of what are the online Python is doing? It was, possibly. It yeah. I don't, I don't see stuff like that very often. Again, I ran, I ran it many times through the whole first session, didn't have a problem. Perhaps if I had refreshed the page, it would have gone away, but I didn't want to lose all of this, so. So okay. That happens to somebody when they're trying to run. Just hit stop and go again. Might be a good idea before you try to refresh the page to copy your entire code, like select your whole code and copy so you don't lose anything, right? Um, on this compiler, you can also save your code with this little uh, disk thing up here. Save it to disk um, so you really don't lose it. You can save it on your computer. Okay. But anyway, um, if you can sort of mentally track going from this, sorry, this print statement here to that output right there, then I'd say that your logic is, is quite strong. So good job. 
you can see that these variables just stand in for whatever value I want to have there. And the min x minus y does exactly what you would expect, which is nice. Python actually reads a lot like pseudocode, which I think is why it's a popular first language to learn. Um, it, a lot of it is, oh, this does pretty much what I'd expect, which is nice. Some code is not so nice about that. Question? Is it the same how you can use what you want to share? Yes, this will be what they're using in the competition. Okay. So automatically, you will do the Yes, um, they will have this tool. Unless I find a better one, but the better one will have all those things with it too. I don't think I'll find a better one. All right. I hope you were able to get that output with your code there. Feel all right about what we did there. You'll see that every piece of this is just built of putting different strings together, and each of those strings might be some expression that's evaluated. Anytime you have output in your code, that you're, in these programs you're writing, at least in a year one, it's just gonna be these simple print statements that are made up of a bunch of small pieces put together with those pluses. Okay, so I hope that is relatively clear to see, even to somebody who hasn't experienced much programming before. All right. Now I'm gonna use my friend copy paste, which is a programmer's best friend. I'm gonna copy this line here, and I'm gonna paste it twice, and just change it to the other two operators that you need to know, which are multiplication and division. So let's just change our output here. Times, it is shift eight on your keyboard for an asterisk. We'll change it there. And then I will do division, which is a forward slash right there and there. So there's your multiplication and division. Those are your common arithmetic operators. And there's my result. You can actually see we've got a repeating number there. That's how many uh, decimal point numbers that it will store in an ordinary variable there. So that's minus times divide. Yeah. Copy paste is a good friend here. The shortcuts on your keyboard for copy paste in, in Windows um, that you'll want to become familiar with if you're going to do any coding are Control C for copy and Control V for paste. Those are, yeah, coders' best friends. Question? Uh, I did it up here. Um, certainly, you're welcome to copy this again and just change these to pluses. That's fine. But I did it up here, so I figured that was enough. No, um, the scope of this doesn't cover mod, but I would normally teach it if I had more time. You have some experience, I see. <laughs> he asked about the secret arithmetic operator. <laughs> Good. Mod's very useful in coding, especially for determining if a value is even or odd. You just do mod two, right? Really useful. Um, but uh, it's not covered in our scope here, so I'm gonna leave it. By the way, the course that I teach uh, at the high school level is a, like I said, a, pro a programming and game design course. I think I said that. Um, and we have students, sending school students at the Panko from a bunch of different districts. So if you happen to be in one of those districts and you're still interested in coding when you're a high schooler, uh, yeah, come and take my class. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> okay. So uh, the copy paste makes that go down pretty smoothly, I think, but um, that's what you're, you know, if you used these values, if you used other values, don't worry about it, but this is more or less what your output should look like. Any questions about that? I think if you, if you really understand the concatenation piece and understanding we're just putting different little pieces together in our print statements, it becomes a lot easier. I had some confusion about that in the first uh, session, but I think that if you take these little pieces and put them together, then you know it's not so bad. And that's what the compiler does. It evaluates each of these separately and then puts them all together at the end. Okay, good, all right. Let's give you some more control over program flow, because so far we've made a fancy board processor and calculator. So let's extend your knowledge a little further. Uh, Boolean values. So um, a Boolean value is simply a fancy word for true or false. Um, this, this gentleman, George Boole, one of the earliest logicians, uh, discovered this, like how it would be useful in logic, and he's like, oh, I'll just name this thing that will be used forever after myself. So there we have it. That's, how, that's one shortcut to fame. Um, so Boolean values, true or false. 
Um, so my Boolean operators are anything that evaluates to true or false. They're different from the arithmetic operators that we saw up above, plus, minus, etc., because those give me a number. A Boolean value gives me a true or false. So an, uh, an example of a Boolean operator would be like greater than, less than. Um, so the Boolean operators we will look at here. Oh, no, that's not right. Uh, Boolean true or false operators that we will look at are greater than, greater than or equal to, which is two characters here, less than, less than or equal to, and then um, the last one that we'll look at here, uh, I guess I guess I should cover not also, because we didn't cover not in the first section, um, and we should, it is in the, in the scope here. Um, so we'll say exclamation point is our operator for uh, not, not, um, and then um, the, the last one is, is the left side equal to the right side, which is a double equal sign. So it is equal to. Okay. So those are the ones we'll use. Yeah. So I have my X and my Y values from up above, so I can compare them using my Boolean operators here. So let's just print, um, print stir X is greater than stir y. So I'm going to, this is my context here. And then there, and stir x is greater than y. So these, this is not dissimilar from the statements up above with my plus minus, etc. Um, I'm just using this Boolean operator instead. So instead of printing a number, it's going to print true or false. So if I run that, nope, if I run that, nope, if I run that, there it is. <laughs> Negative four is greater than 13.5, false. Right there in the output. And um, I guess I'll just copy paste again because that's very useful here. And I'll use the equals operator, so equals equals, whether the left side equals the right side, and then change that here. And that'll also be false because those numbers are not equal, but uh, at least we can see it in action. Boy, this thing is being finicky here. Okay. So my first one checks whether the left side is greater than the right side. Um, you can see those numbers there. Negative four is not greater than 13.5, so it gives me false. The second one is checking whether the left side equals the right side, um, which also gives me false in this case. Now that's all well and good um, for printing true or false, but that's not especially useful in coding. And here's where we get to where we can actually use those Boolean operators and expressions to do something useful. Um, so with that, we have what are called if statements. So an if statement uses a Boolean operator um, or, uh, to determine whether a condition is met, true or false, right? Um, and then if it's true, it runs a block of code, and then if it's false, it does not run that block of code. Okay, so we'll do an if statement here with if, and then you put the, the Boolean condition in parentheses here. So we'll say if x uh, plus y is greater than zero. And then we use a colon here to indicate that we have a block of code. Now the way um, the structure works here, so uh, let's say right there. the block of code will run if the condition is true. OK, 
Okay, so what we can do here, um, the indentation is important here. In Python, um, it doesn't use special characters for indicating a block of code. It uses indentation and uh, the uh, enter instead. So everything below this that's indented like so, um, using the tab, will uh, be the block of code that we're talking about. So I will print um, x plus y is positive. And, you know, we'll print something else too. We'll just say, have a nice day. Yeah. Now, if we run that, we should get that to print because we know that 13.5 and whatever the small negative number, when you add them together, it is positive. It, it goes great. That's your question. Does spacing matter? Uh, yes, this is a tab right here. Um, other than indents and tabs, I'm saying when you're writing the string. Other than indents and tabs, no. Okay. Except for, you know, in your literal strings inside the quotes, whereas what you see is what you get. Right. So spacing matters there, but uh, that's just for output. Okay. Um, good question. The only time spacing matters in Python is um, where you hit enter and if you tab over. So if you space at the beginning of a line, that could probably confuse it. <laughs> um, otherwise, inside of a line, it should not matter. Good question. Okay, so if we run that, we see that a, that block of code will run right there. There's the output from it in my simple print statements. Okay, um, because that condition is met. Now, if I change the values, which I will do now, um, I'll change the, the y to be just one or something like that. We'll just say right here, we'll add a y equals one right above it. You'll notice I'm just reusing that same variable that already exists and just giving it a new value. Okay? So if I run it now, it will skip that block of code. There is no x plus y is positive. There is no have a nice day. Uh, I have not been given permission to have a nice day. Because if that block of if that condition is not met, which it's not anymore, because now it's negative 3.5 plus 1, which is negative, um, then it will skip this block of code. Okay. A tail that I can add on to this thing is what's called an else statement, um, which is just if that first thing didn't run, the second thing runs. Else. And make sure you use that colon, and then a block of code goes here. So we'll just print x plus y is negative. There. And we'll give it a have a have an average day. There we go. My numbers were negative. My day is average. I gave the first session a crummy day, so. So putting a note here, this block of code will run if the first one didn't. Now an else has to always go right after an if. Otherwise you'll have a, an error. There it is. Okay, so this time uh, it ran the second block of code as you can see in my output there. You can put whatever you want in these blocks of code. It doesn't just have to be print statements. It can be new variables that will exist for that block of code. It can be more if statements. You can go as many levels deep as you would like. Um, it can be anything that you will learn. Any code can go there. Are there any questions about the logic there, how if statements work? It checks that Boolean condition, which evaluates to either true or false, and then if it's true, it runs that block of code. If it's false, it skips that block of code. And optionally, we can put an else after that, which will run only if the first one didn't. Yes? Um, will they have to know, like, 
I think you can get away on the test without it, okay. um, but the, the logic there is not bad to know, certainly. Right. And it's not especially complicated. In Python, it's, it's, you, I mean, it sounds like you know it, but uh, yeah, it's LF in, in that. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of get a gauge for it. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think that they will specifically need it for, I don't think we have that on so the scope. I think just like, if and else logic. Yeah, they would only need like, they only have two options for something, basically. Yeah, um, in any of the free response code that they'll write, certainly they'd only have two. Um, whether it's whether there's a multiple choice question about that, I guess we can. I have the uh, the the scope here, so we have. I've only got if else on the scope, so if there are any else if questions on there or elif in this case, I will omit them. It's certainly a good thing to know, but I don't think they'll need it for this. Just trying to gauge for the mm -hmm. just how many levels deep they're going to have to think. Yes. All right. No questions about the logic there. Were we able to get the output expected? No objections to moving on. Okay. So that's a very quick look at if else logic. It's what makes Boolean operators so useful. Um, when we're comparing various things, as you'll see in a moment. It doesn't just have to be a simple comparison here. It can be something a little more complicated. Okay, so uh, loops. So the first type of, there, there are two types of loops I want to look at here. Um, the first one is called a while loop. Um, that's while, W-H-I-L-E. I, -I -L -E. I have had students in the past tell me that I pronounced while with my Michigan accent as wow, W-O-W, -W, which is not correct. Um, so I've had to very clearly enunciate that every time I refer to it. It's a while loop. Um, the, uh, a while loop is easy to understand if you understand if statements because a while loop is simply an if statement that runs on repeat. Okay, So it checks the condition and then it runs it or doesn't run it. And then when it gets done running, uh, if it ran, it checks the condition again. So if that condition doesn't eventually become false, it's going to run forever. Um, that'd be an infinite loop. But in this case, so uh, a, a while loop is basically an if statement on repeat. It runs as long as, oh, I don't want to do it before, which is go to the next line with a comment. Uh, the condition is true. So let's give our uh, x and our y, I guess, new, uh, well, let's make new variables, that's fine. Um, we'll say word equals um, jax. You guys have seen those little metal pointy jacks. Uh, and then um, we'll say number equals And what we're going to do here, so I've created a couple of new variables um, called word and number. And I'm going to check if the number in a loop, I'm going to check if the number is uh, greater than the length of the word. So I haven't shown you how to get the length of a string yet. I'll show you that here. So in a loop, check if the length of the string is of the word. Yeah, greater than the <laughs> less than the number. There we go. Did a bad job of saying that. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do. It'll become clear when I actually do it. I think. Okay. So my condition is while, and um, it, it works the same way as an if statement. Just while, and then a condition. So while number is greater than. Um, and it's len word. That's how you get the length of uh, a string. So, length of word is len word. So as long as the number is greater than how long that word is, and that word is five characters long as we can see, then this will run. So what I want to do in here is maybe print a message um, talking about 
how long that string is compared to that number, and then do something to the number so it will eventually become false. Otherwise, it will run forever. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna print um, word has length less than or equal to, and then uh, number. Oh, I gotta do the stir. Don't forget your stir. Number, there we go. Yeah, I think my logic there is good. And then what I should do is I should reduce the number so that it'll eventually hit that. So let's say number equals, I'm gonna do something that would never work in a math class here, um, because when you're setting a value for a variable, um, it evaluates the entire right side and then stores whatever the result is in the variable, okay? So what I'm gonna do is number minus one, which is a wild thing uh, that, that would make zero sense in a math class. In coding, it's, it's perfect, <laughs> okay? So, um, the assignment operator equals um, evaluates the right first. So number minus one is whatever the number is minus one, and then it updates it to the variable. That's why that works, okay? So you can run that much, and what you should see is that um, Jax has length less than or equal to, and then whatever the number is, and then you see the number go down by one each time, and eventually when that condition is false, when the number is no longer greater than the length, then it will no longer run. So that's a while loop. It's just an if statement that keeps running and keeps running and keeps running until um, it's no longer true. Nope. Yeah, there it is. And my output ceases once I get, oh, maybe the or equal to wasn't necessary. Well, number is greater than, yeah, I shouldn't have said or equal to. Let me change that to just less than. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Made a logical error in my output. Oh, run. Run sometimes. There we go. Okay, so that's how you use the, um, the len method to find the length of a string, um, and that's how a while loop operates. And also how you can reduce a number, reduce a variable by one, just number equals number minus one will do. All right, so a few new things there. Feel free to stop me if you have a question about anything I've covered here. There's no limit to the number of variables you can use, and certainly to the number of times you can reuse a variable. You can do all those things as much as you like. So in, in the end of the while, I have to end with that. The colon, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how it knows you're starting a block of code beneath it, and everything that's in that block of code has to be indented, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, normally in um, other languages I've worked with, the C languages at least, um, you would use curly braces to indicate a block of code. Here, they just streamline it and they use indentation, which uh, makes it easier to read, I suppose. That's as far as my output goes, by the way. That's, that's it. Because on the last thing, the number becomes five, and five is not greater than the length, so that loop is finished. Am I all right to move on? All right, hearing no objections. Um, there's one other type of loop I wanna show you. It's called a for loop. A for loop is made specifically for running a certain number of times, okay? Um, so, a for loop runs a certain number of times. 
Um, specifically in Python, it's meant to follow some variable that you declare uh, that starts at a value and ends at a value, and it just counts up by one each time. Okay, so we're gonna use a for loop to count to 10 here. Um, so the, the syntax is this, it's for, and then you declare a variable, so we'll say num in range uh, one, and then we want it to stop it, uh, to go up through 10, and then stop when it gets to 11, so the, up, the upper number is 11. And we'll just print, no. That's it. So that range function automatically takes that variable starting at one and going up you know, until it gets to the end number and it doesn't run that time. So, um, num will go from one to uh, 11 minus one. That's how the range function there works. That's it. And, uh, you know, if I were doing normal print statements, this would take me 10 lines of code uh, to print the numbers one through 10. But as you can see here, all I need to do is a couple lines of code with a loop and it will print and it will print yeah, all the numbers one through 10, there we are. Okay, and you can change that range to be whatever you like. Um, I could, could have printed one through a million there, uh, but it would take a, a while to scroll through, so I will not. If you change those numbers, I mean, uh, that's numbers one through 10. If I, if I changed it to be like eight and then, you know, 13, then run it. Yeah, it prints eight through 13, or eight through 12 there. It's always the number minus one. I'm gonna change it back to 111 because uh, that's what my note says. <laughs> okay, so that's a for loop. Again, this is this is just a quick look at these various things. You'll want to spend some time like getting your hands dirty with some code uh, between now and the event. All right, that's loops. Um, all right, nearing the end. Arrays. So uh, an array is a special type of variable that's not one value, but it's a whole collection of values. These are also known as lists. In Python, they're essentially the same thing. Um, in other languages, arrays and lists are two different things, but uh, they've both got some stuff in common. Um, arrays for our purposes, you can almost think of a string as like an array of individual characters, right? So we've kind of seen this sort of thing before. Um, but uh, to declare an array, square, uh, an array is a collection of values, so we'll just say uh, my array equals, just declare it like any other variable, and then use these square braces, which are above your enter key and a little to the left, um, to say what goes inside of it. So I will say, um, you know, dog, cat, I don't know, and separated by commas. Uh, monkey and emu. Is that what emu is? Like a llama or an emu. Okay, so um, this is an array that holds four strings. I believe uh, even in Python, they all have to be the same type, but don't hold me to that because they might not have to be. Hmm. We're gonna do stuff with them that we want them all to be strings in our case, but they can be whatever data type you like collectively. Maybe they don't have to all be strings. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. <laughs> but it's a collection of values, okay? There are four of them. So just use the square braces to indicate that when you're declaring it. You can also access the individual values by using the square braces. So use the name of the array and then the individual values to get that value out. Um, I should warn you that the counting here starts at zero, not one. The first value is always spot zero, not spot one. Okay, so um, you can index in array value at a given spot starting at zero. So I'll show you that. Print um, my array, or first value in my array, how about that? Would be, and then 
we'll do my array and I'll use the square braces and put a zero in there. It gives me the, the first value of my array is dog. That's my array at spot zero. That's what those square braces do. I usually use the language at for that, um, for indexing, but it's my, my array at index zero, if you can see that. One handy tool here, um, just like a string, you can use the len method for finding the length of an array. And um, regardless of the length of an array, you should know that the last valid position in, in this, the, the last index, is the length minus one. And you can see that above. Um, my, my indexes are zero, one, two, and three. The length is four, so it's always the length minus one. So if I want the last element in the array, last value in my array, I'm not going to put a number in here. I'm going to put the length of it minus one. So it's my array at and then the length of my array minus one. That's the same as saying three here, right? Because the length of the thing is four, four minus one is three. There you go. It's an emu. Just part of the name, yeah. Um, that is what's called camel case, where you start, uh, in terms of convention, your variable names should, aren't required to, but should start with a lowercase letter, okay? Um, and this is camel case, is the official name for it, where you start a new word with a capital letter. One thing you can't do is put spaces in a variable name. Okay, and that's what I was wondering, that's not expanded, but it's the square brackets that makes the array. Correct, that variable, that's just the name I used. That could have been my first array. Yes, good question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Sadly, I don't have much time to cover all the different convention things proactively, so you asking that question helps me a lot. Understanding this line of code is good because you can see that instead of a number, I used this expression that evaluates to a number. All right, um, this len works um, just like it did with a string; gives you the length of the thing. So, um, oops. the last valid index is always the length minus one. Two things left. One of them isn't even a new thing, it's just combining a couple of the previous things. You'll note that I have been doing a fair bit of that throughout. Uh, once you've got concatenation, everything else becomes a lot easier with your print statements, right? Um, once you know that every expression that evaluates to a number can be used in the place of a number, it makes your code a lot better. That's why variables are so powerful. Okay. So what I'm going to do, if there are no objections to moving on, is uh, I'm going to combine the last two ideas, and I'm going to use a for loop to go ahead and go through an array and go to each spot. Okay. So I'm going to use a for loop to 
uh, this is called traversing. Um, traverse, which is visit each spot in or each index. And array. Great. So I'm going to make an array of um, integers this time. And uh, so we'll just say numbers, I guess, equals. And, and you can just pick a bunch of values. Do some positive, some negative, because that'll be the easiest thing to work with. Um, so just seven, negative two, four. They don't have to match mine. It, it, any values. Um, just do a bunch of them. Two, negative two again. One, four, 11, negative six, zero, eight. Sure, whatever. Don't feel like you have to match mine. Just an, an integer array. Bunch of values, okay? Uh, I don't really care how long it is for this traversal I'm about to do because I'm going to use just len in place of it. So if you have a, an array that's a different length, it doesn't matter. It'll work beautifully. Okay? So my for loop is going to go like this. It's going to be for, um, we'll call our variable here i. That's a pretty standard name for this, um, for index or iterator if you want to argue over it's fine. <laughs> Uh, and we'll do in range, and my range is going to start at zero, and then my second argument here uh, is going to be length of the thing. Because remember, it always goes to this spot minus one. Len, numbers. So my comment is i goes from zero to length minus one. All right, and then we'll do something inside of that loop. What we'll do is we'll print each value, and then we'll use an if statement inside of there, because you can put whatever you want in there, and, and it's good to sort of review our if statements, and um, we'll, we'll print a message if the number is negative. How about that? Yeah, why doesn't the second argument have minus one in it? Because range stops uh, when it gets to this. Good question. We saw that up above when we wanted to print um, one through 10, we had to put one comma 11. Put a little note here for that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and, and print i, whatever it is. Or sorry, not i, we don't want to print i. That would just give me zero through the number. We want to print numbers at i. So numbers at i, there we go. That's the value. Scroll up here a bit so I'll have room to get all this on here. And then we'll say, we'll go a step further and we'll say if uh, numbers at i is less than zero, we will print um, negative number detected. How about that? It's going to go on the next line, so I need to kind of handle it that way. So what this does is it prints the current array value. Index, and then uh, this if this value is negative. And it's going to loop to everything, no matter how long or short you made your array of numbers there. So we should run that. Okay, this is going to actually print the entire array, so I have to kind of scroll through it for you to see all of it. There's seven, negative two, and then it prints that message. Maybe I'll put a tab in front of that message so it sticks out a little bit. How about a backslash T here? Run it again. Again, when you're writing your own code, I really encourage you, pretty much every time you make a change, go ahead and run it again. There's no cost <laughs> to running it again. The tab looks better, I think. Okay, so. Negative seven, negative two, negative number detected, tab, tabbed out there. Six, two, negative two, there's another one. One, four, 11, negative six, negative number detected, zero, eight. And then it printed that whole thing for me. Okay, so that's called a traversal. A traversal just means go to each spot in an array. Yes? We won't do separate steps, I don't believe. I think range is as far as we'll go with the for loops because it's the simplest one to use. Good question. Okay. 
And again, I, I don't need you to match my values, and it'll work with any values, <laughs> any uh, numerical values, I should say. It ends up looking like this. I can't show you it all at once, but. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. The last thing then, as I said, it's all the way at the top. I did put a note there and I didn't, uh, I said I'd get to that at the end. So we're, we're just about at the end here. Um, functions. So you can write your own blocks of code to be called whenever you would like from elsewhere in your program. You can control program flow that way. Um, what happens in what order, basically. Um, so at the top of your code, you just want to put um, a function up here, which is your own, all the way up. There's my, there's my name. Okay. Um, a function is a block of code that's going to run when you call it. A function can receive information from when it's called, and that's called an argument. So you can change what you send. So um, let's do, it's DEF for define. Um, we'll, we'll call this just my function. And we'll say it takes in an argument called X. Okay. So this finds a function that accepts an argument called X. That's a piece of information that is sent to the function when you call it. All right, we're going to keep our function very simple and wrap things up here. Um, I'm going to print uh, function called. I'll do a backslash n here too, so it's nice and neat. And then I'll print the value that was passed in. Argument received would be stir x. So um, we've been using functions pretty much this whole time. Uh, print is a function that exists already in the language. Um, len is a function. Range is a function. Okay. So um, this is how we write our own. And it can do whatever you want it to do. We will not have to deal with um, return values. I don't believe that's uh, not, not in our own functions. I don't believe that's covered in our scope here. I'm gonna double check that, but uh, I'm pretty sure not. It's functions, just functions calling and writing. Yeah, you don't need to return a value for those. So if you happen to know your coding, that's further than we'll go. All right, we do need to know how to call this function that we wrote, so that's how we write a function. There it is, it needs to go at the top if you're gonna write your code like this, otherwise it won't know what you're talking about because everything is kind of read in order here. Um, so if we've got that function defined that just prints this message and then prints this message with what the argument is, right, whatever it is. Um, then we're gonna go back down to the very bottom of our code and we'll call the function. So we will go back here, oops. Uh, call the function defined at the top. That's my function. So I'm gonna run my function, just use its name, and then in parentheses you have to give it an argument because we specified it takes in something called x. x can be whatever. So I'll call it a few times. We'll go call it with 6. We'll call it with um, Garfield. We'll call it with, um, you know, well, how about we call it with, uh, do x and y still hold numbers? How about x is greater than or equal to y? <laughs> it should print a true or a false, right? All it knows is it needs one argument and it's gonna print that argument cast to a string, so. So we run that and then there's the results. Um, function called argument received six. Function called argument received Garfield. Function called argument received false. X is not greater than or equal to Y. Is X still one and Y is 3.5? I don't remember. If you can track that logic of what we covered there, you are well on your way. You will need much more study to master these concepts and practice with them, but um, that's a year of coding in an hour and change. Um, the one concept I realized that I didn't cover here, and I'm not gonna go back and try and hit it now, but I realized that as I was doing the conditional logic and Boolean logic, you do also need compound operators, which are and and or, 
for our purposes here. So make sure you look at that in your studies. Um, yeah, that's, that's just putting two separate Boolean statements together where it's this and this, this or this. Make sure you take a look at that. But uh, other than that, I think I covered every single thing on our scope, so we did all right. Uh, any questions about any of this massive code that I've written? We're gonna save this file and make it available to you on the website. Um, the video of this particular session will also be available. And did I forget anything? Okay. Uh, we're providing them, right? We are providing a computer that will have a browser. Mm -hmm. Can they use their own or do they have to? They cannot use their own. That way, it's perfectly fair. Um, and you are allowed one page of you are allowed one page of notes front and back uh, written. So that's an extra tool you can have if you want to like remind yourself of some of these methods and things, and, and even some code on there. Depends how small you can write. But whatever. question? When they use it, like they're going to be using somebody else's computer at a time, but are they going to be using this? This site, yes. This will be our, um, I, I find it very unlikely that, I, that we're gonna change from this. If we do, we'll certainly make an announcement and it will be to something better. But as far as I know, there's nothing better, so. We wouldn't change it right before the term. No, not the day before. But if, if we, if, if in the unlikely event that, that I uh, did a hostile takeover and we did, uh, <laughs> then um, in that case, it would, it would work the same way as this. It would not be fundamentally different. And I encourage you to go check out, I linked to a few different compilers in there. You're gonna find that they're all the same thing. This is the language. Question. Um, it's not really a question. Uh, there's this thing called the uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, other, other compilers, yes. Uh, by all means, feel free to look around. Could you repeat that? Uh, is it pi, pi what? Tron. Charm. 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 Oh, PyCharm, sure. Um, most of the really good compilers, this is nice for learning at this level. Um, but when you're making your projects and things, generally you'll want to use one that is um, downloaded on your computer and has all of the supporting files to really make your projects sync. Um, the uh, uh, idle is one that I used for my Python <coughs> coding, um, and it's massive. So um, this is really just a beginner's uh, level compiler for coding. Um, if you want to go further into it, I certainly encourage you to do so, but this will get the job done and it's what we're going to use for the event. Anything else from anybody to get on the video? Yes. Is there, um, so I know that there's going to be, I know there's a sample uh, multiple choice mm -hmm. questions uh, that are in JavaScript right now, but will be changed? Will Our be, will plan is to update those to Python this week. Will, will there be any sample questions for like the pre-response, uh, the coding questions? Right, so um, I have cut the number of uh, coding questions, pre-response coding questions down last year from three to two, and I had discussed with John previously during our online meeting, perhaps taking that third one that we cut and revising that to fit with Python, which wouldn't take much revision at all um, with a sample solution there. So that will be part of the job this week, I expect. Um, so we might, we, you might get something up there, though? Uh, I, well, I think now I can commit to that. said it out loud in front of us, that but we now, might now it's gonna Yeah. Now it's in the work <laughs> right. I said maybe this week, though. <laughs> it will be soon. Yes. Just so, yeah, just so that they can get an idea of like, sure. and how, the, how it'll look when they get online. Mm -hmm. The resources that you have access to in terms of like W3 schools and all those things, they've got a lot of excellent examples as well. Um, I'm. I mean, devising these these questions with uh, a low floor and a high ceiling is the way we say it. So there's going to be part of the question that anybody can do as long as they know how to, let's say, declare a variable and make a print statement. Um, and then it's going to, like, to get a perfect score on it, you really need to know your stuff at that appropriate level. Um, so yeah, I think that every student should be able to uh, find something in there that they can do regardless of their skill level. Anything else? Yes? No, um, we do not need to accept it. The, the question was, uh, do we need to worry about user input in this test? And the answer is no, we do not. Um, you will be assigning any variable values within the 
um, the coding questions, um, and then uh, user input is not covered in our scope. So just to make make sure I'm covered there, uh, so there will not be any multiple choice questions about that either. Um, anything will say a variable contains this value for multiple choice, or assign a variable with this value for for your response. All right. Sure. Go ahead. You just clicked over that. The string manipulation is that the slash t and slash n. Some of that. It's length. Also, um, I think in JavaScript that might have covered substring, but it, it's concatenation more so than that. So it's like make a string that holds this and this and this. That's your concatenation with the plus there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's another look at the, uh, you know, there. Right. We are cutting objects from this. Uh, I didn't cover that today on purpose. We're, we're striking that from the record. Everything else is fair game. And I think I got all of it except for and or right there. So make sure you take a look at that. All right, great job, Adam. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. You are. And did we mention in this session the recommendation about where to start if you're real newbie and you just really Sure. Get um, if, if you're just getting started, if this was the first time you've ever looked at code here today, which I know is some of you, um, W3Schools is a really good resource. And it's, it's W3Schools. Uh, I believe it's a .org. Um, I can probably, here's, here's, actually when I went to go look for the length of an array, that's exactly where I went, w3schools.com, it's a .com. So if you, list, if you look at our, our web page there, the Code Warriors, mm -hmm. right there, it's the second one that's listed. W3schools, right there. Um, and then there's also a link to the Google Scholar that you can go to. Or you can just Google W3schools Python and you'll get there too. Um, so what I would recommend is Python Home and then it gives you a very quick, uh, tutorial and it starts with print statements and there's a hello world to so see you know I'm telling you the truth um, and uh, it goes from there so if like some of it I think after seeing this stuff today explained on a very high level some of it you'll be able to skip through pretty easily um, some of it you'll want to definitely practice with and use the tutorials on there it's all totally free and they, they do a really good job uh, on that side okay thank you, very much. Thank you. good luck folks <laughs>